what I want to do this afternoon is uh, to talk to you about something that my colleagues and I are very excited about, but isn't really finished. And um, well, I hope that the benefits of conveying the excitement outweigh the ragged edges uh, at, the, at, at the end of the, the subject. Um, and maybe it's useful to start with uh, an almost Socratic uh, approach. Uh, I guess it's actually more uh, Galilean, right? The imagining the conversation between people to uh, make a point. Um, so many of us who work at the interface between physics and biology have been part of one of these conversations where our biological colleagues emphasize for us that there's some mismatch between particularly the theoretical physicists' search uh, for simplicity in our description of nature and the biologists' um, uh, exploration of the complexity of life's mechanisms. And indeed, as we physicists try to understand what happens in the phenomena of life, we do often oversimplify. And in these conversations, you know, many things happen. I've, I've phrased this in relatively polite form. It doesn't always come out that way. Um, and of the, I, I think sometimes when we, uh, when we engage in these conversations, uh, we tend to talk past one another. And there's a very important response, I think, that, that as physicists we have to this accusation of, of oversimplification that we don't often give. And that's, um, you know, biologists shouldn't feel special. It's not only that when we look at biological systems, we tend to oversimplify. It's also true that when we look at the inanimate world, we also oversimplify. And, and indeed, um, we, we moderns, right, uh, we are so used to the fact that this works that we don't often think about it except perhaps when we're teaching the right segment of a statistical mechanics course or something where we're trying to explain to, to our students what's really going on. So just to be sure we are all, uh, as we say in American English, on the same page, um, let me remind you, right, we routinely describe magnets using the Ising model, but the Ising model is not a correct microscopic description of what's going on in any real magnet. Okay. Um, and nonetheless, uh, if you use an Ising model to describe a magnet, you can get a description of the phase behavior of the magnet that is correct qualitatively. And as you all know, in the neighborhood of the critical point, you can get behaviors uh, which are correct quantitatively with essentially uh, all of the microscopic parameters of the problem having faded away uh, from your description. And these predictions are, are you know, uh, as far as we know, essentially exact, right? I mean, they agree with experiment to, to three decimal places on experiments on real materials. And um, the, the understanding of why it's possible to do this uh, came uh, in, the, in the 70s um, with the advent of the renormalization group. And um, roughly speaking, what you could say is, um, whoops, let's see if I can figure out how to do this. If I have some microscopic system in which there are variables that live on a lattice, and I try to describe what's happening. I might write down the probability the joint probability distribution for all of these variables. So if I'm doing equilibrium statistical mechanics, this is the Boltzmann distribution, and it's determined by the Hamiltonian that describes the interaction among all these variables, which since I've written them as sigmas, you might guess would be spins, but that's actually not so crucial. And this microscopic description could, in principle, be quite complicated. In addition to uh, spins interacting with each other because they happen to be next to each other, you could imagine that they interact across diagonals, that they interact over longer distances, that they interact not just in pairs, but 
in combinations of four around a plaquette and so on. Um, after all, uh, the notion that, that what you're describing, uh, for example, in a magnet are spins, you've already integrated out uh, many electronic degrees of freedom in order to have the spins left over. So this description could be quite complicated. And what the normalization group teaches us is that, that if we now try to coarse grain our description, so we average together the variables that are close in space, we get new variables. And of course, these variables are in turn described by some joint probability distribution, or equivalently by some effective Hamiltonian um, that couples all of them. And what we are instructed to do is to think not about uh, you know, what is the correct scale on which to do the coarse graining, but rather to ask, as we coarse grain to longer and longer length scales, if you want, iterating um, this block construction, the description of the system flows in the space of models. That flow is the renormalization group flow. And the crucial result is that in many of the problems that we care about, the flow is towards simpler models. That is to say, most of the complicated microscopic terms that you might be tempted to write down at this stage will eventually disappear if we coarse grain out to longer and longer length scales. And that's why we can write down simple models and they work. It also means, of course, that if we ask a question at this length scale, then we can't write down a simple model, right? So we all know this. Um, and the question that, that my colleagues and I have been trying to think about is whether this uh, path to simplification that we understand in the context of statistical mechanics is something that we can use in a biological context. So we know that at short distances, the microscopic variables of biological systems are many. Um, they interact with each other in complicated ways. Um, and, and it's, uh, it's a challenge to write down a full description at this shortest microscopic length scale. But it's also a challenge to write down a microscopic description of a magnet or a fluid that's valid at the, at the shortest length scale. And yet, somehow, we succeed by coarse graining outward and arriving at a simplified model. And let me emphasize that um, in some sense, in this, th this notion of simplification is very different um, from, I mean, you, again, you know, you, this is something that, that, that is familiar, but maybe we, we, don't often, uh, um, we don't often emphasize it. You know, our, our description of the physical world is simple for two very different reasons. One is that, in some cases, the world really is simpler than it might have been. So this, if you will, is the simplification discovered by particle physicists. But then there's also the phenomenon where, as you go from a microscopic description to a macroscopic description, the description itself simplifies in the process of changing length scale. And that's, if you will, the simplification that's discovered by condensed matter physicists. And these are different. Right? And and this one, the one that, that we're talking about here, is in some sense, the simplification itself is an emergent phenomenon. Right? It, it only happens when you scale outward. OK, so how could we do this for a population of neurons? And uh, in just a moment, I'll show you uh, what it means to look at a population of neurons and what our microscopic variables are and so on. Um, but before doing that, uh, let's remember that there's an enormous obstacle. And that is that neurons are extended objects. So um, a neuron, it has a complicated structure. It can receive inputs, which is to say interact with neurons in a radius that is a reasonable fraction of a millimeter. And yet the distance from one neuron to another is measured in microns or perhaps tens of microns. So the, 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 the length scale of the interactions is very much larger 
than if you want the nearest neighbor distance. Now, it's also true that there are very sparse, very long range connections. So the connectivity or the interactions are somewhat local. It's not true that a neuron over here and a neuron over there, uh, you know, five centimeters away in your brain are going to interact uh, as, as frequently as two neurons that are sitting right next to each other. But it's also true that within the radius uh, of interactions, there can be thousands of other neurons. Those neurons come in many different types and so on. So our usual notion that what we're going to do to simplify is to coarse grain where short distance details are the things that we get, get rid of and long distance things are the things that we keep, that's not quite going to work because the interaction range is so long. Okay? So the idea is that we're trying, and let me emphasize that what I'm going to describe to you is a try. I think the spirit of what we're trying to do, I, I really believe in. I think, I think there's really something to do here. I'm not at all sure that the particular thing that we've done is really the right thing to do. Okay? So if you think about when we do renormalization in real space, what we're doing is coarse graining by grouping variables with their neighbors. Okay? And the reason, of course, is that interaction, we do that in, in systems where the interactions are themselves short ranged. And so um, you, it makes sense because what you're doing is grouping uh, variables with the other variables with which they directly interact. But you know that there's another way of doing, uh, of implementing the normalization group, which is in momentum space. And then the way you think about it is, I have this description of my variables in space. I Fourier transform so that I have uh, variables now indexed by, by a wave vector k, which um, is the, the momentum. And I average over all of the high momentum components and transform back. And in that way, generate coarse grain variables that are analogous to the coarse grain variables I get by putting together blocks. And roughly, and as many of you know, um, the renormalization group in statistical mechanics, sort of, I mean, the renormalization group in field theory began here. The renormalization group in statistical mechanics began there. I think it's fair to say that if you really want to calculate something and have control over your analysis of a model, you should probably do things in momentum space, although there are a variety of real space uh, um, approximations. Um, if you are thinking about analyzing the results, for example, of a Monte Carlo simulation, then it's much easier to think in real space because you, you know, that's how you get the data. right? You could, in principle, transform to momentum space, but people don't usually do that. So how are we going to take these ideas over to a context in which we don't have the strong locality of interactions that we're used to? So what we're going to try and do by analogy with what we do when we do real space for normalization, is we're going to try and coarse grain not by grouping neurons with their neighbors, with their spatial neighbors, but by grouping neurons with the other neurons with which they are most strongly correlated. The idea being, of course, that if you have a regular lattice and interactions are local, then your strongest correlations are with your spatial neighbors. So these two notions are more or less interchangeable when you have local interactions. When you don't have local interactions, you have to decide what to do. And so we're going to try out this idea of grouping neurons with their most correlated partners. What's the analog of working momentum space? I'm going to say a few words about this at the end. Um, again, I think this is an interesting idea in terms of analyzing models. I'm a little less clear about how useful it is in analyzing data, although I'll show you some examples. Um, Remember that in a system with translation invariance, by, um, by, by Fourier transforming, um, what you're doing is diagonalizing um, the covariance matrix of, of, of correlations, right? So if you compute a correlation function in real space, you can think of that as a matrix where the indices of the matrix are the, the, two are the spatial indices of the two variables that you correlated together. And because you have translation invariance, if you Fourier transform, you've diagonalized that matrix. And the, the, the correlator in momentum space is essentially the eigenvalue of that matrix. 
So you could say, well, if I have a collection of variables that are fluctuating, and they're correlated with each other in some way, even if I don't have um, spatial structure, I still have a notion that I can diagonalize the covariance matrix. In fact, that has a name. They're called principal components. And the, um, I can put the resulting eigenvalues in order, and I can say that there are certain modes analogous to short wavelength Fourier modes that make very small contributions to the total variance. And other components analogous to the longer wavelength Fourier modes that make very large contributions to the total variance. And maybe a natural way of coarse graining is to remove or average over those, uh, those eigenmodes that make small contributions to the total variance. And as with the momentum space normalization group, or momentum shell normalization group, we want to move our boundary between the degrees of freedom that we keep and the degrees of freedom that we average over. So we're going to try out both of these ideas in the context of real data. And what I want to caution you is that although um, we certainly, uh, when, we, when we teach the ideas of, of the normalization group and we look at the history of their development, they are approaches to the analysis of models, right? It's, it's a theoretical subject. On the other hand, it's also true that coarse graining is something that you can do with real data, right? You can take, for instance, the positions and velocities of all the molecules in a fluid and average over them to get local densities and local velocity fields and so on. And presumably, if you do this right, you'll discover that those coarse grain variables obey the Navier-Stokes equations, as opposed to whatever the complicated molecular dynamics was that you started with, okay? And so it's that sort of empirical approach that I want to try and explore. And um, as a result, it's completely phenomenological. So uh, I, I think most of you will guess that uh, we're hoping that this is a path toward the construction of theories for these networks. But we're some distance from being able to do that. And so I don't want you to get your hopes too far up. Yes? Uh, what, what is the fundamental question? With, new, with neural networks, we biologists ask the question is, how does a network start from some certain inputs to get certain response? We can pass a horse, we can pass a dog, yes. go and eat, go fetch something. What, what's, what's the question that you want to ask? So um, let me, uh, OK, I'll, I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll tell you precisely in a moment, but let's um, we know that, right, when we want to do statistical mechanics, the, the first thing we do is we write down the joint probability distribution for all the microscopic variables. So what I would like to be able to do is to write down the joint probability distribution for the activity of all of the neurons in the network. And I presume that if I could do that, I would see in the structure of that distribution features that correspond to its function. So for instance, if the network were um, the a Hopfield-like network that, that recalled memories, what you would find is that the probability distribution has many peaks in it that correspond to recalling the individual discrete memories at different moments in time over the course of a very long experiment. Alternatively, if the um, function of the network was to accumulate evidence for, uh, for uh, making a decision, you might imagine that the probability distribution uh, would be concentrated along a ridge, and that as you move back and forth across the ridge, you have evidence more for one alternative versus uh, evidence for the other alternative, and so on. So it's that joint probability distribution that I'd like to characterize. The relationship of, precise relationship of that to the biologic, to the function of the network and the organism, that's, that's a second job. And, and maybe we're being, uh, we're handicapping ourselves by sep trying to separate those jobs. And, we can ask that question at the end. Um, and again, let me emphasize that we should be cautious. So uh, the work that I'm going to talk about grows out of a long effort to try and give a statistical mechanics description of networks of neurons and, in fact, other biological networks. Um, it started when we were thinking about populations of neurons in the retina. Um, we're also collaborating with people who are working on populations of neurons in, in the little worm, C. elegans. 
I'm going to talk about a set of experiments done in David Tank's group, um, which are on uh, neurons in, in the hippocampus of a mouse. And I'll tell you more about that in a moment. Um, in addition to our experimentalist friends, of course, there's been a series of uh, theoretical collaborators, some of whom have found their way here to Paris. Um, and it's also been very important, at least to me, that the same mathematical ideas have made connections uh, to, to problems as diverse as thinking about uh, large uh, the sequence diversity in large families of proteins or the organization of birds in a flock. And the sort of going back and forth among these different problems um, has been an enormous amount of fun. But I'm going to focus on um, this very recent work uh, that grew first out of things done with Serena Prade and uh, has mostly been driven by one student, Linoy Mishulam, who's been looking at the data coming from uh, David and, and Carlos and their postdoc, Jeff Gauthier. So here is um, the experiment. Uh, so what's going on here is that there is a, oops, sorry. Um, there is a genetically engineered mouse, which is sitting here. And this mouse has been genetically engineered so that it makes a protein which is fluorescent. But the fluorescence of that protein depends on the concentration of calcium in the environment. And in neurons, um, in your brain, every time there's a pulse of electrical activity, every time there's an action potential, calcium rushes in and is slowly pumped back out. And the result is that if you monitor the calcium concentration, you're seeing a slightly smoothed in time measure of the electrical activity. And so what, by genetically engineering the animal, what you've done is arrange for that calcium concentration to be readable by optical methods. So you shine light on the, on the neurons, and they glow. And the intensity of the fluorescent glow tells you about the calcium concentration inside the cell. So first, you have to do the genetic engineering. And by the way, these calcium-sensitive fluorescent proteins are related to and are composed out of proteins that occur in nature. But of course, you have to do a certain amount of, uh, of chemistry to figure out how to put them together so that they do what you want. And you have to do a certain amount of molecular biology to make sure that when you put it back into the organism, it actually shows up in the neurons that you're interested in. So that's the, the biology you have to master in order to get the experiments to work. Um, in order to see this, you have to build a microscope that allows you to look in. Um, you're looking through a certain amount of tissue. Uh, you would like to, ha you need, although neurons that individually are quite decent sized, there are several, the cell bodies um, that you see here are uh, perhaps 10 microns across. You'll also notice that they touch each other very closely. And so you need rather high spatial resolution in order to get an image that allows you um, to separate the contributions of all the individual neurons. And the way this is done is uh, with scanning two photon microscopy. So you use uh, a high power pulsed laser, the Thai sapphire laser, which is sitting here, um, that finds its way in. And you look into the brain of the mouse. You illuminate a small spot and then collect all of the fluorescent light that comes out and then move to the next spot. And so these images are created in scanning mode. They're not, there's not a picture, right? It's something that you put piece together. Um, and there are obviously trade-offs of time resolution and spatial resolution and so on. Um, so there's quite a decent bit of experimental physics that one has to master in order to build the microscope. Um, the problem, of course, is that in order to get, and so what you're seeing here is this reconstructed image from the scanning, which shows you individual neurons turning on and off as they're electrically active or silent. Um, there's a problem, which is that if you're trying to do very high resolution microscopy, it would be very nice if the thing you were looking at didn't move. Um, on the other hand, there are many, many things that happen in the brain that don't work at all if the animal's not moving around. So the the solution, there's many different solutions. The one that uh, David and his colleagues have advocated is that you hold the mouse by its head, 
and let the microscope look in. So the head is not moving. But the mouse is free to run, as long as he doesn't move his head, on a styrofoam ball, which is levitated with a column of air. As he runs on the ball, you use another kind of mouse, um, a computer mouse, to monitor the rotation of the ball. And if you know the rotation of the ball under his feet, you can calculate the trajectory that he would have taken had he been free to run. And you can then use those signals to drive the projection of an image onto a screen that wraps all the way around the mouse, thus creating virtual reality for your experimental subject. So um, it's, a, it's a marvelous combination of molecular biology, experimental physics, uh, uh, sort of computer science, and um, the, the PhD student, Forrest Coleman, who first built this virtual reality setup in David's lab, um, at the core of the virtual reality setup was um, uh, an engine taken from computer games. And David and I always joked that this was the revenge of his generation on us. Because we, of course, always told our children, who were approximately the same age as our graduate students at that point, that time spent on computer games was time wasted. And so this was the direct demonstration that we were wrong. Um, it's a marvelous experiment. And so uh, you can do this. And of course, by uh, since you're control you've built virtual reality, you're controlling the setup, you can create all sorts of environments, all sorts of complicated tasks, and so on. Um, in this case, it's relatively simple. The animal's just running uh, along uh, a virtual track. And at the end, he's rewarded, and then he starts over again. Okay? It's not, it's not a, there's nothing very complicated going on. There's other versions of the experiment in which he makes decisions and does all sorts of things. Um, good. So that's the setup. And uh, the animal can do this for a noticeable fraction of the afternoon. So you can get, collect quite a lot of data. So what do the data look like? Well, it's a fluorescence signal. The fluorescence signal has a relatively small and quiet background, which is nice. And then occasionally, you get little bursts. Now, there's a discussion to be had about whether the, the amplitude of the bursts is meaningful. Um, but to first approximation, let's not worry about that. And since it has this bursty structure, let's just agree that the neuron is either on or off. And uh, the decisions about what's on and what's off, you know something about the, um, the dynamics of uh, calcium binding and unbinding to this molecule that is the, in the fluorescent indicator. And so you know, for example, that this decay here has the form that you'd expect if basically the calcium concentration had fallen abruptly and you're just waiting for the calcium to fall off of the indicator molecule, and that's why the fluorescence is varying slowly. Similarly here, um, this fall is too fast to be consistent with the, with the system being on the whole time. So mostly, the decision about what's on and off is relatively straightforward, um, but there's a little bit of uh, calibration of the underlying probe that you need to do. Um, it's not absolutely crucial to the discussion, but, but it is in there, so you should know about it. And so what this leaves us with is a description in which the individual neurons are either on or off at each moment, at each slice of time. And the slices of time are tens of milliseconds, because this is coarse-grained. And of course, the state of the entire network is this whole set of binary variables. So now, what are we going to do? Well, what we'd like to do, sorry, let me go back a moment. What we'd like to do is to describe the probability distribution the joint probability distribution of all of these variables. But instead, what we're going to do is follow this idea from the normalization group of um, gradually coarse graining and asking what happens. And I'll remind you right, that, that there's several possibilities. One is that as you coarse grain, it is, of course, possible that probability distributions become more complicated. In fact, in the first step of coarse graining in real space, that is usually what happens. But then the complexity dies away because there's only a small number of relevant operators. It could be that the probability distributions become simpler. And 
it could be that they remain invariant. So what we're looking for is the approach of probability distributions to some fixed form that describes the behavior on the longest scales, on the most coarse grain scales. And we know that associated, if we can identify those, those fixed distributions that the coarse graining is approaching, that the coarse grain variables are approaching, then um, it's also true that the trajectory of moving toward those fixed, description, fixed distributions is associated with certain scaling behaviors. So there's the trivial one, right, where what's going to happen is that you just keep averaging things together, and eventually the central limit theorem takes over, and so all of your probability distributions become Gaussian. And that's not very interesting, but, but it can happen. And, um, and then the scaling behaviors are very simple, right? If you, if you sum up n variables, you expect that the variance of, those variable, of that coarse grain variable is proportional to the number of things that you added together. So what we're doing is for every neuron i, we find its most correlated partner. So really, we should do this in a, in a rigorous way. Um, but if the structure is reasonably clear, you should be able to get away with doing it greedily. So what we do is we look for the pair of neurons that are the most strongly correlated. And we say those two are going to get added together in the first step of course graining. And then we look for the pair of neurons, the next most correlated pair of neurons, and so on. And once we've done n over 2 pairs, right? We've grouped together uh, all of the variables into pairs, and now we can iterate. And as we do this over and over again, what we're eventually doing is producing clusters of neurons. We're producing variables that, that describe the summed activity of clusters of two neurons, four neurons, eight neurons, and so on. And this is meant to be analogous to looking at blocks of spatially contiguous spins that you've, that you've averaged together. So since we're adding them up instead of averaging, because it's a little simpler just to think about, um, if the neurons really weren't very correlated at all, well, so first of all, since you're adding them up, if you ask what is the mean activity of the neurons, remember, these are binary variables. So they're 0 and 1. Um, if you compute their mean, you're just asking what fraction of the time is the neuron on. If you ask about the mean, you know that it's going to be proportional to the size of the cluster because you're just adding. But if you ask about the variance, that's a little more interesting. So if the neurons that you're adding together were independent of each other, then the variance would grow linearly with the cluster size. On the other hand, if the neurons that you're adding up were perfectly correlated with each other, then the variance would grow quadratically with the cluster size. What you actually see in the data is that it grows as a power of the cluster size, but the power is intermediate. Okay, so that's your first hint that there's something interesting about the structure of correlations in this system. Um, good. So we've grouped variables together into clusters. So remember that the, that the variables start out being binary. So when you've grouped together, let's say, 32 neurons into a cluster, there's some probability that all of those neurons are off. And so the entire cluster is silent. And so this summed variable will also equal 0. So let's ask, well, what is that probability? Well, imagine that you could write down a model for the probability distribution. And you would write it, you know, there'd be a, a term that was sort of magnetic field-like. There'd be a, right, these are binary variables, right? So you're tempted to write some Ising-like model. Um, there, of course, could be higher order terms. We have no reason to think that we stop here. But the important point is that if we're in this representation where the variables are 0 and 1, then if we ask about the probability that all the variables are 0, we just get the partition function or, alternatively, the free energy. Yes? Uh, the cluster be joined? Uh, we've done it that way, yes. You can ask whether we should do it that way. But <laughs> so the question is whether the clusters are disjoint. Um, so I find the two most correlated neurons, and I cluster them together. And I take them out of the problem. Then I find the next two, the next two, and the next two, and so on. So now I have disjoint pairs, and then I iterate. So they stay disjoint. Um, so you know that if uh, you, know, you expect that 
that if you put more and more neurons together, the probability that the entire group will be completely silent should go down with the number of neurons that you're putting together. The question is, how does it go down? If they're more or less independent of each other, it should fall exponentially. And you might guess that, if you got, that even if there were some correlations, if you got to the point where you were averaging together enough neurons that you're past that scale of correlations, again, you'd recover some simple exponential behavior. In fact, what you see is that this free energy, which turns out to be negative, uh, right, so that the thing is falling, um, it behaves as a power of the, cluster, of the cluster size that is slightly smaller than a one. Um, and, you know, um, and maybe this is the moment to say that we are somewhat astonished by the size of the error bars and the closeness to the line. Okay? So I don't, we don't really know yet um, what to think about this. But um, let me take this as a, there's two, there's two points to make here. One is that, you know, there's a large literature on people seeing power laws in complicated non-equilibrium systems, including biological ones, and saying that it has something to do with critical phenomena and so on. When you look at many of these examples, the power laws exist over relatively small dynamic ranges, and they're not really all that good. And a crucial feature of the scaling behavior that helped us as a community understand critical phenomena in the normalization group is that the closer you look, the better the power laws are. Right? It's not the other way. It's not that you thought it was a power law, and then you look closely, and it was only almost a power law. Right? The scaling behaviors get better the closer you look. So we should really, if we're going to see scaling behaviors, we should hold ourselves to a high standard. Because that's what it's going to take if we expect to connect the theory in a deep way. The second observation, so that's one thing. So that's why we should be cautious. The flip side of this is to note that there is a tendency, as physicists, to think that experiments on biological systems are complicated and messy, and that you, know, you shouldn't expect very detailed agreement between theory and experiment because everything's complicated. Um, I don't think that that's quite respectful of the state of current experiments. Okay? And, and so the, the, um, the sizes of error bars and the, and the closeness to scale and the, the degree of precision of scaling that you see are telling us about both sides of that, of that problem. Right? Good. So again, you have some scaling with, a, with an apparently non-trivial power. So that was the probability that the whole cluster is silent. Let's now take that out and say, given that the cluster is not silent, what is the probability that a, fra that a certain fraction of the neurons are on? And let's see how that changes as we change the number of neurons that are in a cluster. And what you see is that when clusters, of course, you know, if you have a cluster of two things, then either they're all off or half of them are on or they're all on. So that's a bit complicated, um, kind of funny looking. But by the time you're clustering together, have clusters of 32 neurons, it makes sense to talk about a probability density for the, the normalized activity, that is to say, what fraction of the neurons are on. And what you see is that that probability density starts out being roughly exponential and then has a tail. And then as we average together, as we cluster together more and more correlated pairs, that tail is gradually tamed until finally we see something that's exponential over um, almost four, well, three decades in probability density. And it's also interesting that although we've talked about this where we've discretized the data and so on, you can actually use the raw fluorescence signals themselves without this business of deciding that things are discrete on and off and see essentially the same kind of behavior. So um, this then is about how these individual coarse grain variables behave. But remember that what we've also done in this coarse graining process, right, we've put together a cluster of variables, a cluster of neurons, and the variable we were talking about up until now was just their summed activity. But in some way, this clustering is meant to produce blocks which are like the spatially contiguous blocks of the original real space normalization group. So I could look, right? I, I can't use spatial proximity in the network of neurons, particularly because in this region of the brain, there doesn't seem to be 
a lot of mapping of, of features um, to, to spatial locations. So having put together a group, I can now look inside that group at their correlations. Right? So I could ask, for instance, if I look inside a group of 32 neurons that have been put together here, and I compute the correlation function, the correlation, the, sorry, the covariance matrix, and I look at its eigenvalue spectrum, I see something. And then if I do that for a group of 64 neurons or 128 neurons, I can, I can do the same thing. And you'll notice that there are two interesting features to this. One is that there is a region of the spectrum that seems to be a decent power law, but it's not very wide. But what's really interesting, I think, is that if you take what, are, what we think are analogous to spatial regions of different size, and you look at the eigenvalues and you plot them versus their relative rank, this, by the way, um, remember that if we were in, that if the variables lived on a lattice, the natural thing to plot along this axis would be the momentum. And the edge of the momentum, uh, of, the, of the, the, the highest momentum you could see would be pi over the lattice spacing. So no matter how big the region you look at, right, the highest momentum always stays the same. And so what you'd like to do is plot eigenvalues in the same way, right? So if you start looking at bigger and bigger blocks and you look, and you look at the, uh, the correlation function of the spins and you Fourier transform, what happens is you sort of see the broad outlines of the spectrum, and then you gradually fill in more details, but the right-hand edge is always in the same place. And you explore more and more to the left and more densely along the way. So we'd like to do the same thing here. As we look at blocks that have more and more neurons, we'd like to plot versus the, the normalized rank so that the right-hand edge stays in the same place. And what you see is that um, these... Uh, spectra do indeed fall on top of each other and even interdigitate um, almost perfectly all along here, right? So there's two kinds of scaling going on here. One is that we're seeing that uh, the eigenvalue spectra for blocks of, blocks of different sizes fall on top of each other. And the other is that um, uh, the form is approximately power law. If I would not um, make too much out of, out of this little bit of power law behavior, I find the, the rescaling behavior more, um, more impressive. At this, up to this point, I haven't said anything about dynamics. What we talked about is the probability of finding combinations of neurons being on and off at a single moment in time. And when we've computed correlations, they've always been at the same moment in time, and that's what we've used to create blocks. Now that we have these blocks, we can ask about their dynamics. So for blocks of different sizes, I can compute the correlation function of the coarse grain variables, the correlation function in time. And what you see is what we're used to, which is that small blocks decay, have correlation functions that decay quickly, and larger blocks have correlation functions that decay more slowly. But if you allow yourself the freedom to measure units time in different units for blocks of different sizes, taking out a characteristic time, then these all fall on top of each other. And you find that the characteristic time scales with the cluster size as a rather small power. Okay. The, dynam the dynamic range on this axis is, you know, two decades, which is what we can do. Because the power is small, the dynamic range on this axis is not very large, but that's, that's what you get. Okay. And this, I think, is interesting because um, we didn't use the dynamics in trying to construct these coarse grain variables, right? This comes out somehow. Good. All right, let me take a moment and explain how you would do this all over again in momentum space. So again, you have um, a correlation function indexed by the neurons, a matrix indexed by the neurons. You can, of course, 
resolve this into its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And let me say once more, right, that if you think about this in a system that's translation invariant, where the, the variables i, for example, live on a regular spatial lattice, then the eigenvectors are indeed the, the momentum eigenstates, right, the, the Fourier um, states, and the eigenvalues are, you know, g of k, the, the propagator in, in momentum space. And let's put them in order so that lambda 1 is the largest and lambda n is the smallest eigenvalue. I can now construct a proje projection operator that will filter out, will get rid of all of the eigenvectors that are associated with small eigenvalues and keep the ones that are associated with large eigenvalues. And I can put that cutoff k wherever I want to. Okay? Using that projection operator, I can create coarse grain variables just by, um, in the obvious way, except that there's a typo and these should be j's instead of i's, sorry. Um, so you project in the, in the obvious way. And for simplicity, I'm going to subtract the mean so that we're only talking about the fluctuations. And then I'm going to normalize the variables, as we often do when we actually implement the renormalization group in momentum space. I'm going to normalize the variables. And in this case, what I'm going to do is choose my normalization so that the variance of these variables remains fixed at 1. So as I change k, what I'm doing is if k is very large, then I'm keeping all of the modes in the system. And as I decrease k, I'm throwing away the modes that make small contributions to the total variance. And we might expect that that's analogous to throwing away the high spatial frequencies or the high momenta and moving our cutoff downward to reveal what happens at long wavelengths, the, the components of the behavior that the components of the dynamics that capture the largest fraction of the variability. So let's see what happens. Well, one thing we can do is ask what happens to the probability distribution of the individual coarse grained variables? Well, you start with a very large number of modes. And it's easy to sort of cut the number down by, uh, by factors of two. By the time you have um, only 1 16th of the original number of modes, you have this cyan curve, which you can barely see. Um, if you now keep, cut the number of modes in half again, you have the blue curve, and then the green one, and finally the red one. And at this point, you're keeping of order 1% of the modes that you started with. And what you notice is that you go from 1 16th of the modes down to 1 128th of the modes, so a factor of 2, 4, 8, right? The bulk of the distribution is hardly changing at all. And again, the tails are pulling in a little bit. But you're nowhere near being Gaussian. So what you see is that as you change your cutoff between the modes which you're going to keep and the modes which you're going to throw away as being details, which we would like to think is analogous to moving your cutoff in length scale, then what we're seeing is the emergence of a probability distribution that has an essentially fixed form. And just the, the details of the tails are being tamed as you move your cutoff. Furthermore, since you, um, right, you can think about rotating into the basis that's given by these modes and then computing the correlation function for each individual mode. And if you do that, of course, the correlation functions are all over the place. But if you are willing to measure time in different units for each mode, then you can make them fall on top of each other. And the time scale that you need in order to rescale is a power of the eigenvalue that's associated with that mode. And if you um, go back, You'll remember that here what we're seeing is that correlation times are related to the size of the cluster. And here what we were seeing was that eigenvalues are related to the rank to some power, again, to the cluster size. 
And if you put these together, um, then you get agreement with the exponent that you see here. And now you see more or less a full decade. Down here, um, first of all, you'll notice that these modes are making a tiny contribution to the variance. So there are enormous error bars on your estimates. The, the data just aren't very good. It's also true that the response time of the, of the fluorescent molecule itself is somewhere down in here. So you're starting, the experiment is starting to, to lose power at these, at these short time scales. OK. So I've told you a bunch of things. And as I say, it's very phenomenological. Um, there's a bunch of things you should be worried about. Possibly you're worried about other things also. But let me draw your attention to a few problems. Um, I've talked about doing things with the eigenvalue spectra. Uh, but many of you uh, have worked on problems like this, where you're trying to estimate covariances or correlation matrices from limited data. And as a result, the random errors in estimating the individual correlations conspire to produce um, systematic errors in your estimate of the, under, of the eigenvalue spectrum. So this is the problem that uh, um, goes back to Marchenko and Pasteur. Um, and so you should worry about whether we're getting, we're getting fouled up in these problems. Um, before we ask any sophisticated questions, you might ask, if we just look, if we just ask our experimentalist friends to do exactly the same experiment in the same part of the brain on a different day in a different animal, do we get the same answer? Um, yes, but we would like to be able to say that much more precisely, and we're not quite there yet. Um, the particular region of the brain that we're looking in is the hippocampus, and we know a lot about what the hippocampus does. Um, in particular, the hippocampus has these famous place cells, which are quite remarkable. Um, they have the property that as the animal runs around, um, as it crosses one particular location, a single neuron or a particular neuron will become active. And then as the animal runs away from there, that, that neuron becomes silent. And it becomes active again only when it revisits the same location. And so you might guess that a certain amount of the correlation structure that you see in the network is inherited from those place fields. So if I have two neurons whose place fields overlap, you might expect that their activity would be positively correlated. Because whenever the animal is in the region of one of the place fields, it's also in the region of the other one. And so the neurons tend to be active together. On the other hand, if I have two neurons that have very different place fields, they should be anti-correlated because they can never be on at the same time. So qualitatively, that's true. Quantitatively, it doesn't allow you to understand very much at all. So if you try to explain the form of the whole correlation matrix and so on, this model of place fields doesn't get you very far. And importantly, if you measure the place fields of all the neurons and pretend that all the neurons are independent of each other, but only depend on where the animal is in space, so all of their correlation properties are inherited from this place field behavior, and then simulate what would come from that, you don't get the kind of scaling behaviors that you see here. And I think that's sort of obvious because um, you know, there should be a characteristic break when, you've, when you're averaging together neurons that have similar place fields, you should see one thing. And if you start averaging together neurons whose place fields don't overlap, you should start to see something else. And so you wouldn't see scaling. So, okay. so excuse me. So yes. what you're saying is that these distributions are independent of the simulated network, of the simulated environment that you are making? Um, no, they're not. So. Uh, Presumably. So, so um, the, these experiments are done in one particular environment. I mean, there are other experiments done in other environments. Um, the particular thing I was just telling you, when you want to predict what correlations you would see if the neurons were independent place cells, you not only need to measure their place fields, you also need to use the actual trajectories of the animal in the experiment. Okay? So it's what you would get in this environment. So it's a meaningful comparison. Um, the extent to which you can generalize across environments that to, I mean, we have expectations, but to be fair, we should look at a wider range of experiments. Um, finally, of course, uh, you would like to know something about whether these behaviors are, diff are similar or different in different networks, and can they be classified, and so on. But that's very ambitious. <laughs>
So <coughs> let me conclude uh, by telling you some things that I think are, are very strongly suggested by the data. There is clearly some strong degree of self-similarity in the correlation structure. Okay? That's what all this scaling is telling you. When we construct coarse-grained variables, their probability distribution does seem to approach a fixed form as we coarse grain more and more. And importantly, that fixed form is not the trivial Gaussian behavior. So that suggests that there really is some simpler underlying theory that would capture the self-similarity of correlations and this fixed uh, distribution. And in some sense, the challenge is to construct that theory. I mean, in the same way, right, that when we describe um, critical behavior, we don't try to construct the microscopic model. We try to construct the effective field theory that describes the, the fixed point behavior. So this, the, those words don't mean anything unless you actually have some evidence that there is a fixed behavior out there somewhere that you're trying to describe, right? So if you have an arbitrary, complicated set of interactions, then what you might guess is that if you coarse grain a little bit, maybe things simplify, but then eventually you're just putting together things that aren't correlated with each other. Everything becomes Gaussian, and the, the, the search for simplification leads you to the trivial simplification. So what we're seeing is that there is the chance that there is a non-trivial simplification, that the coarse grain variables obey um, some description which is fixed but not Gaussian. There is a long discussion about notions of criticality in these networks and others. And it's clear that this emerge, these scaling behaviors and the emergence of a fixed distribution are related to that notion. I think the, the best way to say it is that as far as we understand it now, um, arbitrary networks with arbitrary settings of their parameters won't produce this sort of behavior. Right? In the same way that we normally think that, that um, uh, when we coarse grain, right, we, we often get attracted, um, the, the theory often gets attracted to very simple fixed points. The non-trivial fixed points are only occur in special places, only occur when you start in special places. So the fact that we see hints of a non-trivial fixed point with non-trivial exponents of scaling suggests that the network is not at an arbitrary place in its parameter space. And that's related to a long discussion, okay? but it's, a, it's seen from a very different point of view. And then finally, um, the fact that we see dynamic scaling, I think, is, is especially interesting because one of the fundamental problems um, in neuroscience, really, is that the, time scale, the characteristic time scales of neural activity and the characteristic timescales of behavior are completely mismatched. So neurons do things on a timescale of, well, to be generous, tens of milliseconds. Now, of course, there are many things that last longer and so on. But the behaviors that we all engage in involve patterns in time which extend orders of magnitude beyond this. And so there's a long-standing question of how you arrange or how nature has arranged the dynamics of these networks to be able to generate, for example, sequences of behaviors that last uh, for minutes when, um, when the characteristic time scales of the neurons are tens or even hundreds of milliseconds. Okay? So you know, if you have a, a, you know, a, a skilled musician um, you know, sits down to a piano and can just you know, put out a sequence of motor commands, right, to move his fingers, um, that lasts for minutes. And he can do that with earplugs, right? So it's, you, could just, you just spit it out, right? It's not that you're listening and figuring out what to do next. So um, in those and many other situations, we generate sequences of behaviors that correspond to very long timescales compared to the underlying natural timescales of the neurons. And that's true also in our perception. The things that your interpretation of the things that you see and hear at this moment are being influenced to varying degrees by things that reach back many orders of magnitude in time 
relative to the characteristic time of the neurons. And um, it's not so easy to understand what you have to do in a network in order to make sure that you have access to that wide range of timescales. And the fact that we see dynamic scaling is really interesting because it says, I mean, we know this, right? If you have a system near a critical point where you have dynamic scaling behavior, then if you want to access degrees of freedom on a different time scale, just look on a different length scale. And you can do that all you want. So, OK, the experiments that my colleagues are doing, they're looking at of order 1 to 2,000 neurons. And what we see is that as you go from two neurons to 256 neurons over two decades, you can access longer and longer time scales with no obvious end in sight. So we'll find out what happens when they record from 10,000 neurons. So the last thing I want to say is that I think that um, the ideas that, that we have in our community that come, that are grounded in our understanding of the normalization group give us um, a strategy for thinking about um, these new and very exciting experiments where people are, are observing simultaneously the activity of many thousands of neurons at once. So if you're recording from 100 neurons at once, you can really think about the problem of building a model that describes that population of 100 neurons in some detail. Because you can collect enough data to probe many features of the underlying structure. As you go to 1,000 neurons or 10,000 neurons, that starts to become much more difficult. And I think that our one hope for understanding is to have some coarse graining strategy that allows us to take these very large systems, pull back or pull inward, I'm not sure what the right metaphor is, um, to something that involves fewer degrees of freedom and hope that there is a simplification that comes as we thin out the degrees of freedom in the system, just as it does in the systems that we're used to in statistical physics. So thank you very much. If you try to apply your ideas to uh, deep learning networks? So we haven't. Um, there are people who are doing related things. Um, there is, as you may know, a provocative paper which argues uh, by, uh, by Meta and Schwab that argues that the, that the, um, the actual calculation that's being done uh, in the deep networks when they've um, sort of settled uh, into the fully learned state is something like, so that the thing that you're optimizing as you learn is something like successive stages of the variational renormalization group. So that the approximations which are used in learning have an analog in the coarse graining. I don't know whether this is right, um, but it's certainly an interesting idea that, that in some sense these networks are successful um, precisely because they're building coarse grained representations and at each stage you in some sense, do the same thing over and over again. Now, in some cases, that might, it, not only do you do the same thing, you might also have the same answer because the thing you're looking at is scale invariant. In other cases, you do the same thing and you get a different answer because it's not scale invariant. The thing which we are not doing, and it's possible that deep networks, well, the thing that we're not doing, which I would like to be able to do, is that in the conventional uses of the normalization group, the, the collective variables which emerge, in some sense, live in the same space that you started in, right? You start with Ising spins and you get, and you get coarse grain magnetizations. You start with molecular velocities and you get you know, fluid velocity fields, something like that, right? You might want to think about situations in which the right coarse grain variable is somehow a more interesting combination of the things that you started with, and in some way doesn't live in exactly the same space. And that, I don't, I mean, we, we haven't gotten anywhere. Um, but I think that particularly in, in these problems, that might be crucial. And I don't know where the deep networks fall on this. Where would be, uh, what would be the advantage of, ha of being close to a fixed point? For, you know, for biological function. So I mean, um, it, it looks it's better to be far, actually. To yeah. Have. 
So it's interesting. Um, this literature about whether biological networks are close to criticality um, has an interesting flavor. Um, so what my colleagues and I tried to do was to look at, at rather smaller groups of neurons, flocks of birds, and so on, and try to build very explicit models and just ask, where are these models in their parameter space? And if it turns out they're near to being critical, that's an interesting observation, and you could try and understand um, whether that makes any sense or not. There's another literature which says, um, let's think about uh, what would be good for the organism. And they give arguments that being near to uh, a critical point would have a variety of advantages. So in some computational contexts, you might be able to compute more efficiently. Um, in, in, in systems where interactions are local in space, like in a flock of birds, then being close to criticality would give you modes that had uh, allowed very long correlation lengths. And what's important is not the correlation length, but the, the, the distance over which you can get responses, so that if a bird over here notices that it should turn, that can actually propagate through the entire flock, which it presumably would not do if you didn't have approximate zero modes. Um, there are a whole variety of these arguments about why it's a good idea. Um, I don't think it's I'm being unfair when I say that there is, a, there is a substantial literature which is so much more enamored of the arguments for why it should be that way that they become a little less critical about the evidence for or against. So we tried to stay away from this. Um, an interesting feature is that many of the arguments in favor of being critical as being somehow optimizing function, you could turn around and make exactly the opposite argument. So I've emphasized, for instance, that here um, you have access to a very wide range of timescales. And that might be something of great functional importance. But I could say it another way. You know that as you approach a critical point, you get critical slowing down. And we all know that biology likes to respond quickly. So critical slowing down is a bad thing. OK, it depends on how you couple to the system and so on. Um, you know, being being close to a critical point enhances your susceptibility to certain things. Yeah, but you know, it also makes the spontaneous fluctuations larger, and so everything gets noisy. So I think that, that it's, I don't think that people have done an, a really honest calculation that says that being critical is the solution to a well-defined problem that the organism faces. I think there's a, a widely shared intuition that that might be right, and I wouldn't mind I wouldn't mind being the one who does that calculation, but I'm not sure it's been done. So we've tried to stay um, more on this uh, sort of phenomenological side and see where, where things fall. It's also true, by the way, that you know, it's a big deal that we've gotten to the point where we can handle 1,500, 2,000 neurons. You know that if you were doing statistical mechanics and you were limited to simulating 1,000 spins, you might get nervous. So that's another thing to worry about, right? Are we, are we just being fooled by the finite size of the systems that we're looking at? So the mice in this environment there, are they induced to do the same thing? I mean, are they just exploring the environment, or are they walking straight on the track? They're pretty much walking straight on the track, yeah. They get rewarded every time they get to the end of the track, so they get, they get into a rhythm. And so you it's think- It's a little boring. The, the neurons correlated are, are certainly going to depend on what environment you yes. put the mouse in. And so we've also done similar things with smaller populations of neurons in the retina. And we see similar behaviors. Um, uh, again, because the populations are smaller, you don't have the same dynamic range over which you can see things. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, having, done the, having convinced ourselves that we can see something, um, of course, we now want to go back to our experimentalist friends and see what happens in a wider range of conditions and so on. So this is, I mean, it's the beginning, right? I should emphasize that, you know, in fairness to, to our friends, these experiments are not easy. Yeah, so, why, why the hippocampus? That's not the most accessible. No. Um, it's because the folks doing the experiments were interested in the hippocampus for other reasons. Um, among other things, um, uh, so 
Um, it is true that in humans, if you're missing your hippocampus, you cannot form new, mem new episodic memories. That's correct. Now, whether that is independent of the role of hip the hippocampus in navigation is another matter. Um, you might think, for example, that if you're trying to form memories of episodes, tagging them by the place you were when they happened wouldn't be such a bad idea. Um, so it's possible that they're perfectly consistent with each other. Another thing which um, uh, David Tank and his colleagues have recently shown, uh, which is quite remarkable, is that if you set up a behavioral situation in which the animal has to navigate in some more abstract space, so for example, they have to um, experience, uh, they, they um, uh, by their behavior, they modulate the frequency and loudness of a sound. And then when they get to certain places in the loudness frequency plane, they'll be rewarded. So they need to navigate, but not navigate on the floor, navigate in some other two-dimensional space. Um, they learn to do that, and the cell, there start to appear cells in the hippocampus which have responses that are localized in the amplitude frequency plane as if they were learning about places in this abstract space. So this suggests that the whole machinery, I mean, the first place that it was discovered, the place, the first example that was discovered was physical location, but that it might be about navigating in some much more abstract sense if you average over all of our behavior. Uh, so when you see nature and you see magnets, you have as many spins as you have. But when it comes to brain, is an advantage of having n neurons and not n by two neurons? Because the graph that you showed, the p sigma, fall, they fall yeah. on each other. Ah. So why would you have n and not n by two, n by 16 neurons in the brain? Well, um, so let's do, so you're contrasting well, I don't know how to, let's say, let's, okay, let's think about this graph. Um, so what you're saying is that even though I have, I have however many neurons I have, apparently if I keep only 1 16th of the modes in the system or 1% of the modes in the system, I get the same behavior. Well, I get, I get the same behavior if I look at what one neuron is doing. But there are many neurons all doing this. And a, a consequence of that is that by looking at the, uh, the different modes of the system, you have access to a wide range of different time scales, among other things. Okay? And, and the, if we're right that you have dynamic scaling in the way that you have near criticality, then the, range, the full range of time scales that you have access to is determined entirely by the number of neurons in the system. And so um, your ability to bridge timescales from the microscopic to the macroscopic then depends on the size of the network. It doesn't relate to how many uh, patterns. patterns you can store. Well, if so. this were a memory, it would, yes. Um, it's not entirely clear uh, what, it, what the relationship is between what we're seeing here and whether this is, this is a memory storage device. Most people would argue that, that uh, the hippocampus is not a memory store, a, a, a place for storing discrete memories, let's say in the sense of the Hopfield model. It might be a place um, for implementing uh, continuous attractors over two-dimensional spaces so that you can move around and navigate. Okay. But that's a very different problem. And then you might guess that the sort of some combination of the dynamic range, the size of the region that you can cover in units of your precision would be related to the, to the size of the network, but, but that you could nonetheless have a kind of scale invariant behavior. There would be a network that had fewer neurons that covered the same space but at lower resolution in the same way.